So it's a pleasure to be with you today. I'm Dan Sears. I'm the Conservation Director with Columbia Riverkeeper. And I'm gonna kind of skip across a couple different topics. Um, last time I was up here, I talked about Hanford a bit, and I have an update about what's going on at the nuclear site. Um, it's a place where uh, Nez Perce has been weighing in, tried um, very actively for the last, well, for a very long time. Can you? Talk a, bit. talk a little louder. Okay, follow the mic. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, what's going on with uh, gas, fracked gas pipelines and developments on the lower part of the river. And then I'll touch just quickly on where things are stand with oil and oil shipments down the Columbia River, uh, which is an issue that really was very, um, very much brought forward by Nimi Poo, protecting the environment um, a long time ago. So I'll just start here, uh, which is, I'm gonna first discuss the Hanford nuclear site because it's, um, we're at an interesting moment for cleanup at Hanford. Um, I think folks here know that the Hanford, oh, there we go, okay. So the Hanford site is, uh, it is the most contaminated place in the Western Hemisphere uh, because of its history producing plutonium for nuclear weapons for over 45 years. It started during the Manhattan Project. Um, and so there's a sort of very frightening history of making plutonium for nuclear weapons and all the contamination that created. At the same time, this is what it looks like at Hanford. Um, this is the White Bluffs, and it is both one of the most beautiful and also one of the most intact habitats for, um, for fish, for wildlife. Um, for a lot of rare plants and species that we don't find in other places in Washington, because, largely because it was kept off limits um, from development. And so the river in this area is free flowing. Um, we were just out there yesterday and it was, um, it's just sort of a dramatic contrast. It's, it's definitely not a wasteland. It's a place that's very alive because of uh, this sort of ecological potential. And this is the best main stem spawning habitat for Chinook salmon in the entire Columbia River system is right here at the Hanford nuclear site. So I'm gonna talk about um, one of the biggest kind of overarching problems at Hanford is how to deal with high level waste. And high level waste is um, <coughs> basically material that was either spent fuel, so the stuff that they actually used to run the reactors, or things that contained that spent fuel. So very radioactive, typically very long-lived, or at least containing very long-lived radio, uh, radioactive pollution. And a lot of that contamination at Hanford is located kind of in the middle of the Hanford site. But I'll show you a map later that, you know, it seems like a long way from the middle of the Hanford site to the Columbia River. It's, you know, it's between seven and 10 miles. I'll show you a map later that shows that some of this contamination moves all the way through the Hanford site and already reaches the Columbia River which is um, frightening. Uh, on one hand, you know, we, it's frightening, but we also, we're basically relying on the Columbia River and this large body of water to dilute that groundwater as it comes in. Right now, the federal government is proposing really dramatic changes in how they plan to address the contamination at Hanford. Um, I've been involved with the Hanford Advisory Board since 2009, and at no point have I seen anything even approaching the level of um, irresponsibility that we're seeing right now from the Trump administration. Even the Bush administration was, um, was less, less reckless in its proposals uh, for dealing with the nuclear waste at Hanford. And really a lot of what the issue is right now is it's very difficult to deal with the high level nuclear waste. So when they made plutonium for nuclear weapons, they would take uranium fuel, put it into a nuclear reactor, and then they would take that fuel out of the reactor and have just a tiny bit of plutonium in it. And they would dissolve those fuel rods, basically in acid, to pull out that little bit of plutonium for nuclear weapons. And everything else was waste. And it went either into underground tanks or it went directly into the ground in some cases. And so there's this huge amount of pollution that was released into the environment at Hanford that affects uh, the river and the groundwater in particular. And so now the challenge is that they um, are finding it very expensive 
to address that high level waste that was put into the tanks. And the federal government is considering two different ways of basically cutting the costs. And a lot of that material is located in that sort of that center area. But again, it's, it, even though it feels far from the river, it's really, really not very far at all. Just sort of a reminder of what this place looks like. This is another view from the bluff. This is just actually yesterday. You can see one of those reactors that then made the plutonium in kind of the top, uh, a little bit towards the left. And there are nine of those along the river. And then all of the really high level waste is stored further in, inland in the site. It was very bright out there yesterday, so if I look sunburned, that's why. <laughs> Yeah, it's a pretty it's a pretty wild landscape. It's it's really uh, really dramatic uh, those bluffs. So there's two different ways in which they're trying to essentially cut cut back on cleaning up that radioactive waste. And this has been an issue that um, Nez Perce, the tribe, has their environmental restoration waste management program has been very engaged. You know, when I I was just reading um, comments that the Nez Perce tribe wrote back in 2010 when they did an environmental impact statement for the whole site. And one of the things that they determined back in those days was that uh, they would take 99% of all of that high level waste and get it out of the tanks so that it wouldn't just leak out of the tanks into the ground and ultimately move towards the Columbia River. And that's the, it's a very challenging thing to do, but it's also very important. So they set this pretty high bar and they said, we're gonna get 99% of the waste. And so in the simplest, uh, one of the simpler tank farms at Hanford they are trying to say that they're finished cleaning it up. And they've gotten what they say is 96% of the waste. And that's by volume. The challenge is that even if you get 96% of the volume, a lot of the radioactivity sinks to the bottom. And so you may not be getting 96% of the radioactive uh, contamination. And this is something that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has just pointed out to the uh, U.S. Department of Energy, although Nez Perce and other tribal leaders have been pointing this out for, for many, many years, decades in fact. So the Department of Energy wants to, instead of cleaning up what's remaining in some of these tanks, they want to reclassify it. And they want to call it low-level waste. Because if they call it low-level waste, then they don't have to dig it up. They don't have to turn it into glass logs. They don't have to bury it deep underneath the ground. They can leave it closer to the surface, essentially using the soil at Hanford and cement as a storage uh, <coughs> facility right there on the shores of the Columbia River. What's the role of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission with regard to that redefinition? That's a very good question. Um, so the Nuclear Regulatory Commission Go ahead is... And repeat it, would you? Yeah, so the question is what is the role of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in that redefinition of that waste? Um, and so in this case, they're, what they're doing is they're reclassifying it. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission essentially is advising U.S. Department of Energy. And their role is to, is to tell the U.S. Department of Energy whether they've done a couple things. One is have they removed as much of the radioactivity as they could? And have they demonstrated that the waste can be managed as low-level waste? And what's really interesting is just a few weeks ago, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission essentially told the U.S. Department of Energy, you have not met the burden of proof. You have not demonstrated that, which, I mean, I guess I'm on camera, but I'll say as bluntly as I can, I'm, I'm sort of surprised by that, you know, because it's essentially one part of the Trump administration more or less telling the truth when the other part of the administration was trying to cut a big corner. Unfortunately, they don't have an official regulatory role. And so the U.S. Department of Energy, in the end, it's not clear that they have to listen to what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has said. And so we're in a, um, a position where you know, the state of Washington has raised serious concerns. The state of Oregon has raised serious concerns. The tribal entities, um, Nez Perce, Yakima, um, Umatilla, have all stressed that this is a potentially big mistake and um, even the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is agreeing that there, there are major problems. Um, so that reclassification, we expect them to put out a big report later this year that's going to 
try to provide the, the technical justification. And then potentially as early as 20, early 2020 is when we would see a decision, or maybe even late 2019, for this one tank farm where they would say, okay, that's 70,000 gallons of high level waste, we're going to call it low level waste. And we think it's a big uh, potential step backwards in cleanup. There's another um, even more troubling approach that the Trump administration is proposing, which is really a new concept. So, um, and that's to actually change the definition of high level waste. Rather than saying, you know, that pitcher of water, say that was high level waste, rather than reclassifying it, that tank, and saying, okay, I'm now gonna call that low level waste. What the Trump administration is proposing to do, in addition to that, is to actually change the definition of what high level waste means across the whole country. Mm. And, to, and to really um, lower the bar for what can be, can be considered low level waste. Uh, they announced this several months ago, sort of with, um, <laughs> by mumble, mumbling out that there would be $40 billion in savings um, to the U.S. government. Um, and that is, that's clearly the motivation, is, is to sort of throw up their hands and walk away. Um, the encouraging part is that um, I would say that the region, most of the folks here in the region are united against this idea of redefining. There are some in the Tri-Cities area who say, well, maybe this will allow cleanup to happen faster I think that's, a, that's an unrealistic view in my, in my perspective. I think it's very unlikely that um, changing the rules in this way will result in anything other than the Department of Energy abandoning high-level waste at Hanford on the shores of the Columbia River. So I'll talk a little bit more about the specifics here um, because I think, I think it's interesting. Oh, yeah, actually, one more, okay. One of the issues that um, Nez Perce Tribe has, a, has an expert, um, Stan Subchik, um, who has worked for the, the tribe on and off for many years, he identified you know, potentially that um, there could be a lot more technetium in the area that they were trying to reclassify the waste than the Department of Energy has acknowledged. The reason that's so important is technetium is very mobile. It moves with groundwater. So if you leave it in the ground, it's going to get to the Columbia River it's also very long lived. So it has a 210,000 year half life. So that's how long it takes for half of it to naturally decay away. Um, it is present in pretty high levels in this area that they're trying to reclassify the waste. So the, the drinking water standard is 900 picocuries per liter. Picocuries, are really, it's a very small amount of radioactivity, um, but it's very, Technetium is very potent. Um, and of course, that type of radioactive contamination can give you cancer. And it's one of the main reasons why we're so concerned about this. Um, <coughs> Department of Energy, one thing that, that Nez Perce Tribe has pointed out is that um, there appear to be inconsistencies in the, in the kind of waste they're finding in this tank farm area um, compared to the analysis they've done. So he pointed out that there was arsenic in the area, and there wasn't supposed to be arsenic in any of the tanks that had been involved in the leaking, but there were some other tanks nearby that did have arsenic, and they had very high levels of technetium associated with them. And so he sort of suggested, if there's arsenic, there could very well be much higher levels of technetium, and it just points to a, sort of an underlying, um, an underlying uh, dynamic of not being sure about how much radioactivity they would be leaving in place. So that uncertainty is really raising eyebrows and causing some alarm. Um, the other thing that was just interesting to point out is that the wells in the area in the last groundwater monitoring report, they were saying, oh, you know, everything is kind of on the decline, so it's okay to re reclassify this waste. And actually, very recently, some of the wells showed the levels going back up which, and going back up well above the drinking water standard. So finding levels of um, over 7,000 picocuries per liter. You know, so that's many, many times. What, that's eight times, I think, above the drinking water standard, roughly. So 
a lot of concerns there. And, you know, the last time I talked about this, it wasn't clear kind of what posture the state of Washington was going to take on this. And I wanted to just acknowledge that because of pressure from um, Nez Perce tribe and from Yakima Nation and Umatilla tribe and from people all over the region, the state of Washington is taking a stronger stand and they have objected to the way the Department of Energy is pursuing this reclassification. And even more fundamentally, the state of Washington is really, really alarmed by this idea of changing the definition of high-level waste. So it's kind of um, one is sort of a microcosm of the other. Um, to reclassify the waste is a big mistake. To change the definition of high-level waste across the whole land of the United States could have very long-lasting damage um, throughout the United States in places that have high-level nuclear waste. Um, so the governor and the attorney general made a very strong statement opposing this, and I think it's, I would consider it probably likely that the state of Washington will challenge, I can't speak, I, I don't know this, I'm just speculating based on their statements that um, hopefully they will challenge this um, when it becomes a final rule. Um, so they said, you know, they, they, they refer to it as a disdain and a uh, disregard for state authority. More fundamentally, I think it's a disdain and disregard for the people who rely on the Columbia River, who live downstream, who would rely on this place, Hanford. Uh, you know, people have, have lived there, gathered there, and fished there since time of memorial. And then getting down to the real point of the whole thing. So what is the Trump administration really up to? Um, they would like to stop spending so much money on cleaning up nuclear waste so that they can spend more money uh, building weapons. And they were blunt about that just last week. Uh, they, they spoke to the Tri-City Herald and threatened to even veto the House's budget, the U.S. Congress's budget, because they thought it had too much money dedicated to addressing nuclear waste at Hanford. And on that issue alone, they were threatening to actually veto the budget. Yeah, there are two different streams. One is the commercial high-level waste, and then the other is from making nuclear weapons. And so some of that high-level waste, the funding for the cleanup does come from U.S. Department of Energy because they were the ones who actually produced it. Um, so there is Congress in recent years has basically funded Hanford at about $2 billion a year um, to continue the cleanup. Um, the, your point about the Nuclear Waste Policy Act and, you know, long before my time when you were, sounds like very involved and know a lot more than I do about this, um, when Hanford was proposed to be the high-level waste dump for the entire nation, the Basalt Waste Isolation Project, I didn't even know what that word meant until I found a document that was from a comment, for, I think it was from Nez Perce, uh, objecting to the BWIP. Um, back in those days, and, and that's an amazing accomplishment. If I, we think about now, like, we're refighting some of these things and trying to protect Hanford from the waste that's already there, but a whole generation of people successfully stopped Hanford from being a dump for other stuff coming from outside, which is, an inc it was an incredible accomplishment. So just want to acknowledge that, that that happened long before we even got to this point. Yeah, there would normally be, it would be in like um, Seabirds or REM. Um, so when it's in Curies, that's just the amount that's in the actual groundwater. So that's the physical measurement of how much radioactivity. When you get to the point of deciding whether it's dangerous to a person, you're absolutely right. It's measured in different units that reflects um, a dosage. And there's been, so for a long time, you know, people have, the Department of Energy has kind of worked on trying to really limit the range of how people can be exposed, trying to say, well, people don't, if you're out there digging roots, that you wouldn't inhale very much dust. And so they try to really lowball the amount of um, potential contamination that you would be exposed to. And that's, that's one of the really big underlying dynamics with Hanford, is having a realistic assessment of how people could be exposed. So you're right, it's not, it's not really uh, very good to just reduce it to the groundwater drinking standard because the radioactivity is it's in the soil, the groundwater, it's also in the vegetation. It's in it gets into the animals, you know, where they a couple years ago they found a ra radioactive rabbit that was hopping around, they found the droppings and it was screaming high in cesium. And so they had to find this rabbit that was 
mobile, you know, mobile radioactive vector. Did the rabbit have tumors? No, but they, they euthanized it as radioactive waste. Yeah. That sounds like a parallel to... So fish consumption standards, I think, um, I think it would be giving them too much credit to say that what they're doing <coughs> at Hanford is directly connected to that in that way. Um, a lot of what, what underlies their assumption is really, it's even more fundamental than that. It's, it's, um, it's the Department of Energy's projection that no one will ever live here. And it's that simple. They're, they're saying they expect a big chunk of Hanford to be off limits essentially forever. And that's why they feel like they can leave radioactive waste there that's high level. And um, people around the region are really pushing back on that. You see that free flowing river, people obviously live there in living memory and fish there, gathered there, people will come back. Um, I think there is a connection between the two that does, uh, it was actually very relevant to the discussion we are having beforehand um, about really a failure to, um, a failure to look at how people are actually exposed to the chemicals they get in the environment. And I'm talking a lot about radioactivity, but one of the biggest risk drivers at Hanford is also the toxic chemicals because in building these facilities and, um, and, and trying to pull out that little bit of plutonium, it was an incredibly toxic process. And that created a stew of both radioactive and toxic material that is very hard to deal with. And so people can get, we hear about workers getting sick out there and it's, it's mostly the toxic vapors um, with chemicals that are making them ill. And so looking forward, it's not just the radioactivity, it's also the hexavalent chromium and the uranium, which is dangerous as a heavy metal in your body, in addition to being dangerous as a radioactive material. So um, there's a lot to consider, and I, I feel like there's a, I think what we, we are hoping most for at this time is for the state of Washington to take as strong a stand as possible and push back on both the fish consumption weakening, which Governor Inslee, you know, did not do, um, and, but particularly on, on the radioactive contamination. And to their credit, they are speaking up about that. Um, you can find contamination in salmon that is um, uh, radioactive elements. You'll find uranium in salmon. Um, there was kind of the, one of the landmark studies was done back in 2000 um, that looked at a lot of the contamination that was building up um, in salmon. But um, it's actually, they have it the best, the salmon. It's, it's the resident fish that have much higher levels. And what they find is um, quite a lot of uh, mercury, which is a yeah. problem throughout the Columbia River system. Um, but you also find contaminants from Hanford in fish at Hanford. Um, so things like hexavalent chromium, which is acutely toxic um, to fish, uranium being another big one. Um, and so those for resident fish, the Washington Department of Health has a fish advisory for that part of Hanford. And they recommend, for instance, I think walleye is one meal a month. Um, and I think there are, um, I know bass may be also one meal a month. I probably, myself, would avoid eating a resident fish from Hanford. Um, I know sturgeon, people fish for sturgeon there quite a bit. Um, people catch a lot of sturgeon actually in the Hanford Reach, in part because when they had, they built those reactors, they dug out these deep holes to suck in the water into the reactors to make nice, big, deep sturgeon holes and people catch a lot of fish there. And how they grew? They did a whole um, experiment near the end reactor where they planted things to see if they could actually use the vegetation as a way to yeah. draw up the radioactivity. And it was, so or, you know, yeah, it was sort of successful. <laughs> but what they discovered is they were concerned about it coming up into basically the biosphere and then animals or plants or insects yeah. moving it around. Pretty much anything I say is something I've learned indirectly at least from Russell Jim. So <laughs> he is an he was an amazing yes. um, repository of knowledge and his passing was really a, um, it was a huge loss yes. for cl cleanup of Hanford, but also, oh, yes, it was. Um, Way of life. yeah, 
um, it's hard to overstate, you know, because he was working on the same yes. high-level waste issues before, when I was literally in diapers. Yes, he was, I know. <laughs> yeah. And I think um, the big, one of the challenges now is to keep that going yes. and for a new generation to learn yes. a lot of this stuff. And I know that that's happening, you know, because of um, the work that's been going on to try to train young experts um, so that they become botanists and even, you know, radiological experts so they can understand the studies. And you know, one of the things that he often said is that it makes more sense for people, for tribal people, to lead that research because they, you know, they feel it in their hearts as well as knowing the science. Yeah. Um, and that, that was an amazing contribution. Um, and it's something that uh, I think that, you know, I guess I was just summarized, like when I got started getting involved with Hanford, it quickly became apparent to me that Department of Energy would have, the head of the department would change over every other year, mm -hmm. and the people who knew the most and had the memory were the tribal leaders sitting around the table. Um, and so these issues are issues that, um, you know, one, the, one of the ways that he, Russell summarized, um, in a way that was helpful for me, he said, if you clean up Hanford to meet the Treaty of 1855, then you protect all of the people, not just Yakima Nation. Yes. And that, in true, you know, for Nis Purse and for Umatilla, that, you know, to fundamentally address what's at Hanford, we have to go back to imagining the place being used by people, you know, living there fishing there, drinking from the springs, otherwise you're going to justify abandoning all of this material. So thank you for your family and your contribution this year. Yeah, I, I almost can't say enough to say, you know, the reason Hanford looks the way it does and has the potential it does, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot, go ahead. Well, if you know if salmon are still picking up radiation from Fukushima, and if there's a way to distinguish between that radiation and the radiation at Hanford, because yeah. like they're migrating in the ocean and then they're yeah. up river. You can tell sometimes by the isotope, okay. and so or even the stable isotope to figure out the ratio of the different. So for uranium, for instance, sometimes they pick up uranium and salmon, but that doesn't all come from. Some of that comes from actually from um, fertilizer and industrial chemicals because. The phosphorus fertilizer we use comes from places that have a lot of naturally occurring uranium. But that's one t isotope of uranium. The, naturally, the stuff that is enriched, that's good for nuclear weapons, is a different isotope of uranium. And when you find that, you know it's coming from some place that was making nuclear weapons. Um, plutonium doesn't occur naturally in nature, basically. So if you find plutonium, pretty much it came from Hanford. That's about two thirds of all the plutonium in the United States, I think, came from, from Hanford. Um, other radionuclides are, you'd be unlikely to find them, like technetium, um, that would most likely be coming. If you were to find that in fish, and you do occasionally. Um, cesium is a little bit more difficult, because that one is, you know, from Fukushima, that was what kind of, they've been measuring that circulating in the ocean. Um, it's actually made a really interesting marker for oceanographers, being able to track that cesium coming around, so they can see where the currents move um, very clearly. This is why, um, to kind of take a step back, the reason why these high-level waste issues are so important is, yeah, it's, you know, Department of Energy sort of treats Hanford like a big sandbox. And sort of imagine you put the waste in one place and it moves straight down, hits the groundwater, and then moves over to the river eventually. And they try to, um, they try to really simplify the picture. But actually what you find is that there's so many different waste types, sometimes it was in the soil, sometimes it's an old um, ditch or underground box or tank um, that might break down in 100 years or 1,000 years rather than right now. And then the groundwater doesn't flow in a linear way. It does, sometimes it'll move down a ways and then move horizontally. And this is something that um, hydrologists from, um, well, really from all over the region have been pointing out for a long time to the Department of Energy is that um, they may be under, underestimating how um, how quickly this material can move to the Columbia River. And then, you know, a lot of what we do is sort of imagine 
what, it, what it's like to be right there on the shore of the river, to be that receptor, and try to imagine you know, what that's going to be like for someone 10,000 years from now, um, who may not have the benefit of knowing exactly where everything was buried. Um, and we're losing that, that memory now. Like the people who built Hanford are getting older and retiring and passing on. And that's a, that's a real challenge for people in my generation and younger, is to even know and understand um, what was there, much less what was there long before. This is one of the more disturbing pictures um, I'll share, which is kind of an example of the challenge at Hanford. Um, this is a place where different, it's called like a junction box, and it's an underground structure. There's enough plutonium in this um, underground structure, which is at risk of collapsing, to make a nuclear weapon, um, to give you a sense for how much plutonium is stranded in some of these places. It's kilograms and kilograms of plutonium. And a little speck of plutonium flying around, if it gets in your lung, will give you lung cancer. So some of these places are so radioactive and so contaminated, uh, they pose a, a real challenge. And they're getting very old. They're falling apart. And Department of Energy, I think, is realizing that it's going to get more expensive. The more they drag their heels, the more expensive it will get. And right now, what we're seeing, like literally in the last month or two, is them taking a step back and kind of saying, well, I think, I think we're done with most of this, and basically proposing um, to pull back on high-level waste cleanup in a very, very significant way. Mm. So material like this, which is um, very long-lived, plutonium has a 24,000-year half-life. There's a reason why the law says you're supposed to immobilize it and not leave it in the environment. It's, you know, in 24,000 years, it is guaranteed to move. So is that underwater or under this is Yeah, this is underground. Is it, that's water? No, or no, that's just, that's, that's just air. Okay. So you're saying something that once had water in it, um, that, and now it's dried out. Yeah, that is extremely scary. That is how they cracked. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's, it's like, at risk of collapsing, and when it, yeah. if it does, you could have this poof, yeah. poof of stuff going up. Like when those tunnels collapsed, and that was in the news yeah. out at Hanford, it was this type of old structure with a lot of plutonium, and that's why they, everyone who was working on the site had to shelter in place until they could figure out whether there was plutonium and americium flying around everywhere. Yeah, that was scary. So this is the other, um, and to your point, this is, again, we're looking at basically pico curies per liter. So just thinking in a very linear way about groundwater and how much radioactive pollution is in the groundwater. This just gives you a sense, uh, with really what I wanted to point out with this was, oh, here we go, um, the way it moves. So the groundwater doesn't move in kind of a real predictable way, like a sandbox towards the climate. <coughs> um, Gable Mountain, it'll sort of squish out this way and move around Gable Mountain. And sometimes when the groundwater levels are higher, it'll go that way, uh, or north to the Columbia River. So it's not easy to predict. One of these plumes um, is very large and getting very close to the Columbia River. This is radioactive iodine here, this sort of tan one. This plume, <clears throat> this plume which is reaching the Columbia River, is radioactive tritium, which they actually pick up in the drinking water at Richland, at levels below the drinking water standard, but it is in the drinking water. Um, so again, this is just sort of showing, and uh, <laughs> Department of Energy, when they show us maps of dangerous contamination, they usually use like the most benign pastel colors possible. Right. So that radio, radioactive iodine plume, this tan one, you know, that's, that stuff has a 15 million year half-life, 15.6 million years, um, and you know, it's just shown in this kind of neutral tan color. As you get close to the Columbia River, there are other contaminants that are also directly reaching the Columbia River. One of the most concerning is strontium-90, which um, acts like calcium in the body. So it will get into your bones, and it causes bone cancer. And that's a, a contaminant you find in very, very high levels um, in the 100N area, which has springs. And that's one of the places where they did this experiment to try to see if vegetation could be used to pull it up and then they cut the vegetation and get it away. Um, so that, that research, I think, is still ongoing. I know there were some folks with the Washington Department of Ecology who thought that that could be a very 
uh, productive way of potentially addressing it. There were others who were very concerned that it would just bring that contamination into the environment more. So it's kind of a, that, that's still a debate that's going on. And I just want to acknowledge that, you know, that's first tribe for, for years has been engaged um, on this issue. Uh, so I'm, in some ways, I'm just here telling you what your environmental restoration waste management program has done for many years, and that there's an end state vision for Hanford, which includes people being back at Hanford and using the resources in a very intimate way. And that is, um, that's a goal that I think we share and we want to keep working towards and really pressing the Department of Energy to work on. So that's the, the Hanford part. Oh, I always show this picture just because it, I was in a, it's just, it's just strange. Um, so this is what goes on at Hanford and it doesn't make any sense to me. You can see people wearing, like, this is the tank farm area where they're talking about leaving the waste in the ground. It's so radioactive that there are people in the background in the upper kind of right. You can see they're wearing white suits in supplied air. So they're in full on moon suits with their own oxygen coming in while they work on the cleanup. And then maybe, you know, that's probably only 200 feet. There's this guy smoking, a, he was smoking a cigarette actually, um, right on the fence line with no like visible air barrier. And then we were sitting in a bus on the road. I was just looking at this, I was like, are they trying to make a point here? Like on this public tour, like, how, how can this possibly be an arrangement that's, that's safe for anyone? But um, the person from the EPA said, oh, no, 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 those guys probably don't even need to be wearing those suits, which, um, Don't yeah. they know smoking's not healthy? <coughs> Pardon? Don't they know smoking's not healthy? There's probably a no smoking sign there somewhere, but yeah. <laughs> So the other um, couple issues, um, where am I on time? You're good. Okay, okay, got a little bit of time. So I'm gonna um, transition to talking about some of the fossil fuel issues that have, um, that are a lot of what we work on for Columbia Riverkeeper. And again, this is a place where a lot of interests converge um, because essentially all of these shipments of fossil fuels, whether they be by rail or pipe, they come through the Columbia River, we're sort of situated in um, a critical juncture between vast quantities of fracked gas and fracked oil and coal and the markets that want to consume that overseas. And so we're sort of viewed as a throughway for this. So Hanford is like one time scale. Um, these carbon pollution issues are another. This is, I'm just putting this one up because this is sort of an emerging issue that um, I thought I should update you all on. When I was last year, I talked a little bit about the debate around natural gas and its role in contributing to climate change. And it's becoming increasingly clear that natural gas, which is primarily methane, is a huge contributor to climate change, uh, much more than people thought even 10 years ago. And so it's really dramatically changed. This is a study from 2014 that compared the two bars on the right are really interesting because what they show is that big red area, that's the contribution of methane um, from using natural gas. So if they make, um, make energy out of natural gas, which is primarily methane, burning it only produces about half as much carbon dioxide as burning coal. But in that whole process, you're letting methane escape and it comes out of the pipelines and the compressors. And methane is so much more potent than carbon dioxide that it ends up having even more of a greenhouse gas impact in some instances than coal. In other instances, it's less. But what's important is it's kind of on par. And so if you switch from coal to natural gas, we've just taken to calling it frack gas to get rid of the, rid of the word natural. Mm -hmm. um, if you switch from coal to frack gas, you're really not making any meaningful progress in addressing climate changing pollution. So the Northwest, and one of the issues we've been working on a lot is uh, the methanol refineries. Uh, it was great to, um, well, last time I was here, I talked a little bit about where things stood and that we were really focused on Governor Inslee and trying to get him to change his position on a couple of these facilities. It was great to hear the, that the connection you have with Puyallup and the tribe there they've been fighting a very large uh, liquefied natural gas facility, uh, which is a lot of 
safety issues in addition to the climate issues. And um, associated with all this are, are the potential for big, big pipelines to go in. So down in the issues that I'm working most on are these two methanol refineries proposed in the lower Columbia River, where if you put them together, they would use as much gas as the entire state of Oregon. Um, so tremendous, tremendous quantities of fracked gas going to these facilities. Um, in order to feed these facilities, which would take gas and convert it into methanol and ship it off to China, um, the Chinese government is actually the backer of these two refineries. They're the investor in these two, two projects, which creates an interesting dynamic as well, having a, um, another government sort of officially engaged in this way. Um, they would need so much gas that we're convinced they would need to build major new pipelines. <laughs> And what we see uh, from the gas industry is sort of this admission that there could be new pipelines coming soon. Um, the, the geography of how gas gets into our region, it's not like the Gulf Coast where there's pipelines all over the place. We really only have a few big trunk lines right now. And one of those goes down the east side. It's called the Gas Transmission Northwest, or GTN pipeline. It's this green one. It goes all the way up to Canada. And then the other one is this blue system. And this is all the Williams pipeline. And really what, needs, what the gas industry would like to do is be able to move gas from the east side to the west side. Mm. Right now, the pipelines on the west side are pretty much full, or, or fully subscribed. They're, they're tapped out as much as possible. But that's where all the potential is for exporting this gas to overseas markets. And so they need to really find a way to connect these things, and that's where community opposition has had a huge role in actually stopping them from getting this foothold and getting traction. Um, speak, I heard someone speak of the Klamath tribe earlier, a uh, member of the Klamath tribe, and we have, they've been fighting this proposal um, to go from Klamath to Coos Bay and to export natural gas now for years and years, and they just got a very significant decision from the state of Oregon denying a Clean Water Act permit for that project. Yeah. It was, yeah. And I, I just, yeah, I think it has a huge amount to do with the, the strong advocacy from Klamath tribal members who've come all the way up to Portland and all the way up to Salem for hearing after hearing. That's a long way to come up in the winter um, to speak to the governor and to her agency leads, and, and it's, it's made a huge difference. At this point, you know, the West Coast is, you know, one investor said this is the place where fossil fuel projects come to die because they're realizing every time they propose something, in Oregon and Washington, and even in British Columbia more and more, facing this opposition of, um, of tribes, but also of farmers, foresters, ranchers, people who live in some of these areas also getting organized. And those, that difference in perspectives has been helpful in trying to um, create a broad range of, of opposition. Mm -hmm. But this is kind of the growing front on this whole fossil fuel issue and the climate issue most people have learned at this point that oil trains and oil shipments are a really bad idea, even though the oil industry is incredibly persistent and keep trying to push it. The same with coal. The quote unquote natural gas industry has done a good job of greenwashing itself. They call themselves natural gas and that's something we still are trying to get away from. Almost the vast majority of the gas used in the Northwest is actually from fracking, whether that's fracking in British Columbia or fracking in the Rockies. So that's why we really take into calling it fracked gas. And there's a growing coalition called Power Past Fracked Gas, which is really trying to tackle these things and be a better, uh, be a better assist region-wide to make sure that it's not just <coughs> people like, you know, the Puyallup tribe has been fighting this Tacoma LNG thing for years and years and years, and it took a long time for a lot of environmental groups to catch up and to realize what a big deal it was. And uh, to their credit, they now have, but the Puyallup tribe persuaded Governor Inslee <coughs> to change his position on the project. You know, he had been sort of quietly supporting this idea of using a big LNG tank. And LNG is an issue because they take the gas and they super cool it down to negative 260 degrees Fahrenheit. And it becomes a very, very dense form of energy. And for that reason, it's, it's also risky to have close to people. Um, there's an activist, Dakota Case, who's come and spoken. Um, he came all the way down to, to Kalama and spoke there in support of the people fighting the, the climate methanol refinery. Um, 
from his own experience of you know, his family home looks right over where they want to build or where they are building this LNG facility. Um, and so that, that story was very powerful and resonated with people who felt like they were far too close to what was this proposed uh, methanol refinery in Kalama. So the progress since I was last year that I just want to point out is that um, at least one major permit has been denied for the pipeline in Southern Oregon. That's a huge step. Um, Governor Inslee has now officially opposed both the methanol refinery and the Tacoma LNG facility. That's also a big step. And in Oregon, uh, we won a land use case against the second methanol, ref um, methanol refinery um, where they wanted to put it. And so there's a real potential for that second methanol refinery to, to fall apart and to go away. Um, so that's, that's a, and I'm, this is what the methanol refinery is all about, uh, which is essentially taking a whole bunch of gas and turning it into methanol and shipping it overseas and producing millions and millions of tons of, well, between two and seven million tons of carbon dioxide pollution each year. Go here. back to the previous slide, please. Yeah. This one? Yeah. Yeah. I was just wanting to read that. Thank you. Yeah, so they just did an environmental impact statement um, where they tried to look at how much greenhouse gas pollution they would create. Actually, this is an important slide. I shouldn't try to skip this one. Um, and one of the things they did was try to pretend that that methane doesn't leak very much on the upstream side. And then they tried to pretend that on the downstream end, that no one's ever gonna burn the methanol. That it would be used to make plastic. So I'm so glad you're talking about plastic again today because they're trying to pretend as if making plastic out of methanol is gonna be this great benefit to the environment. They claimed that making plastic out of methanol would take 12 million tons of carbon dioxide out of the environment every year. And what was, yeah. That's a big swing. If you're gonna, if you're gonna lie, you just go for it. You know, just lay it all out. Um, yeah, so when you actually do the math, uh, yeah. when you actually do the math, what you find is that it, depending on how much methane you consider to be leaking and whether you consider that methanol to be burned in the end or not, um, the number is in the opposite direction. It's they're actually going to be producing millions of tons of greenhouse gas pollution. The process is also incredibly water intensive, so we'll be pulling millions of gallons every day into this refinery um, to run the process, and there will be this 8,000 foot tall plume of steam. So the height of Mount St. Helens right there in Kalama, um, along, along the shores of the Columbia River. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of the local folks have been really concerned about it. Wow. So it's, it's a pretty wild project and we're expecting the final version of that environmental impact statement to come soon. What's interesting about that is that the entities that are writing that are in support of the project. And so they've been writing these very one-sided environmental reviews, uh, which is, um, it creates sort of a loop where they write a bad environmental impact statement, we challenge it, we win, they go back, they have to write another one. And so we're, we're gonna see how many times we have to go through this loop before um, hopefully they, they realize this is not a good project. And so it's very positive that the governors come out against this, this proposal. This is just giving you a sense for what's involved. Pipeline to get the gas to the refinery, this big um, refinery complex on the shores of the Columbia River and then shipping that methanol overseas to China, where they would make plastic, or potentially, it would be burned as fuel. Mm -hmm. So this was the, the bombshell that happened um, a couple months ago. <laughs> but sometimes things happen in these fights that you just, you could never, ever predict. Um, this company is looking for additional funding to build their refinery, and in that process, they were out telling potential investors that they were going to have this methanol plant and it was going to be sending methanol all over the world for fuel and for ship engines. They called it convenient LNG, uh, liquid electricity, and another slide they call it liquid sunshine. So I just keep it. But so one of the investors was so freaked out by what he saw, he sent us their, their presentation. And so we get this presentation, we start looking through it, and it is absolutely 100% the opposite of what they told the state of Washington in the regulatory process. So, so we had to think about whether we could actually use this document, which, we're like, well, ha yeah, this guy sent it to us, and so we, we figured out that it was fine because we hadn't done anything wrong, so we, it was, you know, we, we were gonna be able to share this, and so we sent it to the agencies, and then we shared it with the media, 
and it became this huge embarrassment for the company that they were caught lying. They were telling the regulator, oh, our methanol will only be used for plastic and it'll have this really um, benign effect in the environment, where they were telling their investors something very different, that it was all going overseas to be burned as fuel, essentially in, in fuel tanks in China. <laughs> and that, that um, deception, that deceit, really had a huge impact, I think, in uh, stalling this project at somewhat. And so right after this, about a month later, Governor Inslee came out and opposed both Tacoma LNG and the methanol refinery. Uh, yeah, it was really good. So the challenge is, you know, it's kind of like the mirror image of Oregon, where Governor Brown hasn't opposed the LNG project in Oregon, but her state agency denied the permit. In Washington, the governor has opposed it, but the state agency hasn't made a decision yet. It hasn't come to them yet. So the Washington Department of Ecology, um, sometime this year in all likelihood, will have to make a decision about whether this methanol refinery meets Washington's laws, both for um, reducing greenhouse gases, but also for uh, protecting the shorelines there. So progress since I was last here. And then the last thing I'm just gonna talk about briefly is um, this bright white slide. Uh, <laughs> hopefully there's something behind it. Hey, there we go. Um, is oil trains. The first time I spoke here, I think it was it was in July, early July, I think, of 2016. It was about a month after this oil train derailment in Mosier, Oregon. And so what happened here you know, was a real, um, a very jarring event. Um, a couple of people I work with have, um, well, either live in Mosier, or one, of the person, one of the people I work with, his wife teaches at the school. Um, there's a little community school, which is, you can see it's those white buildings right behind where the fire is burning. So this was a train, an oil train, that was moving about 25 miles an hour, going down the Columbia River, that went off the tracks, 16 cars derailed, four of them spilled, and the fire burned for 14 hours. And so you'd think after this event that Oregon and Washington would be like, okay. No more. Yeah, no more of these oil trains. This is, this is just abjectly stupid. Um, that's not what happens. Um, <laughs> They just got sneakier. They did. They got way sneakier. And because clearly no one in their right minds would ever say yes to a big oil train terminal. And in fact, the state of Washington turned down the big oil train terminal proposed in Vancouver. Um, so the oil industry got creative. And what they did is they started looking at old derelict facilities that had gone bankrupt or were being unused. One of them in Portland used to make asphalt. And they're now, it's called Zenith and they're now converting that to be an oil train terminal. They're in fact, they've already converted it, and they're shipping not just oil like this, this is Bakken oil from North Dakota. They're now shipping tar sands down the Columbia River yeah. in increasing volumes. Mm -hmm. And yeah. as you probably know, um, since many folks here really helped to start the tar sands fight in the Northwest by objecting to the heavy haul equipment going up. So trying to stop that equipment going up was very important, um, it helped to raise the alarm about the issue so that people now in Portland are absolutely appalled that we are being used as a tar sands terminal. But those trains come all the way down, um, carrying that tar sands all the way down the Columbia River. And that oil sometimes is so thick and so heavy that when it spills, it can actually sink in the water. It would be essentially unaddressable through a conventional cleanup. Mike is gonna talk more um, about what that tar sands picture really looks like on the upstream end. And I just wanted to flag for you that Although we've made a lot of progress in stopping the new oil train terminals, these little old facilities, are they're trying to convert them to handle heavy oil. There's another one downstream um, in a place called Port Westward that is also um, being used. So this is what it looks like when the oil trains go down the Columbia River Gorge. You can see the oil train there in the bottom. Some people have seen a, an increase in the number of oil trains lately. Uh, Mike and I were talking earlier, people are seeing more and more of them coming down the Columbia River. Um, so they come through, um, they come through Spokane and uh, across from Sandpoint. Most of the trains are coming that way, either from Canada or from the Bakken. But some of the trains that we're seeing now are actually coming from the south, we think from Utah. And so we're seeing different types of oil. All the trains are essentially marked the same. They all say 1267 on the side. 
But that train car could be carrying anything from the Bakken oil, like Mosier, where it, when it spills, it burns very spectacularly, all the way to the other end of the spectrum, tar sands, which is so heavy and viscous that it could sink and poison um, both drinking water and salmon habitat. And obviously the people who are the most on the front line with this are the people who fish between the rail line and the river. And the Oregonian did a really good story shortly after that derailment um, talking about some of the fishing sites along the Columbia River that were very, very close. Like within miles, if that train had derailed in a different place, it would have wedged in people um, who had really no way to get out. Like, yeah, I mean, this is, um, so the, this oil train risk is one thing I wanted to just say is, you know, it's not just people out there anecdotally seeing this, the state of Washington actually measures how many oil trains come through and they're seeing more than a million barrels a week going through yeah. down the Columbia River in oil trains. This is something that we basically didn't do before 2010. The number, the, the number did you just say 1267? Yeah, that's okay. what's on the side of the yeah. oil train car. I'm gonna give that out to you. Yeah, that's actually a great point. So if you start seeing those big black trains going through, um, the place to look for them is like on the, usually the lower right, there's a little placard and it's red and white, and what says one, two, six, seven, that's crude oil. You'll also see very commonly like one, nine, eight, seven, that's ethanol. Um, sometimes you'll see um, other types of fuel that can also be kind of risky, like liquid, liquefied petroleum gas. But what we're seeing more and more is just a ton of those one, two, six, seven trains. So, um, a couple of questions, a basic one. What's, uh, what's the reference for this slide? Yeah. Graphic you created, or is that a no, this comes from the Washington Department of Ecology, okay. and they have what's called an, um, I think it's called the Oil Movement Summary for the State of Washington. Okay. Um, and feel free, anyone who wants any of this information, um, I can give you my information. I'll email it to you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, and this is helpful, but it's actually an undercount. So they only count the trains that end up in Washington, and we're already seeing we're seeing a lot more oil going Portland. already. On two fronts, yes. Um, so in the Columbia River Gorge, I know that um, there were some of the cherry orchardists, they spoke up about these oil train shipments. Some of them came and spoke at the hearings. Um, at the downstream end, way down, here, let me see if I got a picture, I think I do. Uh, scary, scary, scary picture, I don't want to talk about this. Mike's gonna talk about this part. Um, I'll click back, there's a little delay when I click, of course it's when it goes forward. Apparently I have a map here somewhere, but okay. there it is. Okay, so there is, this is one of the sites where they're trying to bring more oil in on the Columbia River. It's a place called Port Westward, so it's just a little downstream from um, like St. Helens and Longview. Uh, the nearest town is Klatskanai, which is that way off the map, but it makes this bend around the Columbia River. Um, so this thing right here, there used to be an ethanol plant right here that they built to make ethanol they have a rail line that comes in and they have a dock there that's naturally deep water. So that's what you need. Yeah. Tanks, rail line, deep water. And the oil industry has figured out that any place they can find that combination of things, tanks, rail line, and deep water, they're going to try to put an oil train terminal. And so this company called Global Partners bought a bankrupt ethanol facility and converted it to moving Bakken crude oil. They did this essentially without anyone knowing. Um, they ended up stopping the shipment of crude oil for years, and they haven't shipped crude oil for quite a while because the market got so weak, um, and they switched back to ethanol. They actually were just transloading ethanol that was made somewhere else. So right now, they're considering an expansion where they're going to buy more of the tanks that you see in the background, potentially build more tanks, and they want to handle tar sands crude in this place as well. So in answer to your question, one of the most vocal opponents of this have been the blueberry and mint and tree farmers who live all around it. There's also a Buddhist monastery right up the hill, um, and they've spoken out against it. So it's a really unusual kind of cool neighborhood of people um, who've spoken up. And um, I know that um, the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission has also weighed in with concern about this proposal as well, as well as uh, different tribes involved with who are members of Critfic. Um, but the issue here is 
they've been trying to rezone a huge area to help create more space for industrial land right here. And this is one of the things that we try to, to, to do is to work with farmers where we can to protect the existing land use of agricultural land um, in some of these places in the lower Columbia River where there actually isn't that much ag land because you know, it gets into hilly um, coastal forest land pretty quickly. So we successfully stopped. Um, so you were looking at it kind of coming this way before in that picture. That whole checkered area is an area they wanted to convert from farmland to heavy industry. And a couple weeks ago, we won a legal challenge on that, which is great. And so the zoning reverts back to agricultural, and we are hoping to persuade the port not to try to rezone it again. Um, in the midst of all this, um, there was a port election while all this was going on. So the, the port commission voted to bring in heavy oil. And in a very topsy-turvy election, uh, where there was one incumbent, there were, there were three incumbents up for, for running. Two of them had challengers, but those two each had two challengers, which was, I sort of thought, well, it seems unlikely that um, any of the challengers are gonna win because they're gonna divide the anti-oil oil vote. Well, they didn't just win, they won. The incumbent lost about 60 or 70% of the vote. So the people in this county were like, ixnay on the oil trains, you know, as quickly as possible. And so the port seems to at least realize that there's a problem there. Um, it was a real shock. And so uh, one activist, a woman named Nancy Ward, won by less than 100 votes. Um, but the other challenger got a big chunk, got like 20%. And the other race, um, uh, an extension agent who's very knowledgeable about the agricultural use of the area, he won more than 50%, while another challenger still got 20. So the incumbent in that case lost 70%. Um, it's just a remarkable, um, a remarkable signal from the population that they don't want to see more of this. What's interesting to me too is how connected these terminals are with the risks that people are facing all the way up the Columbia River. So when someone stops an oil train terminal, like when Vancouver stopped the big oil train terminal, they did a much bigger favor to the people upstream than they did even for their own community in some ways because those oil trains moving 50 miles an hour, that's where the, a lot of the risk lies. Um, the terminals themselves can be very polluting as well. So down here, you know, the folks, if they can stop the oil train down here, they're actually protecting people in Vancouver where those trains would be coming through going way fast. Yeah, and, and when Mosher happened, it was, I think it was only three days after um, the Columbia River tribes, all four tribes collaborated on a press event. I mean, pulled it together within like hours hours of it happening to call attention to this risk that Mike talked about yes. where people were living. Sometimes one disaster may end up yeah. seeing more disasters. And I think it did. I think this was, that Mosher derailment was one of the reasons why Vancouver turned down the new oil train terminal. And so Washington has turned down its new oil train terminals. Oregon um, doesn't have any new oil train terminals. What we have is these derelict old facilities that are being converted. Mm -hmm. And that's the, where the risk is now. And because Oregon is like the Wild West compared to Washington in terms of our environmental rules. We're, we're somewhere between Washington and Idaho um, when it comes to <coughs> environmental reviews. Um, the permitting agencies have done very little to rein this in so far. Um, the city of Portland has expressed serious concerns about the facility in Portland, which was a former asphalt facility, but they haven't actually taken any action yet to rein it in. So we're, um, despite the fact that we have some politicians saying the right thing, um, we do not have, yet have the kind of protection we need from these really risky oil train shipments. Lewiston? Um, the challenge they have is how to get those deep draft tankers out. Yep. And so the advantage they have in the lower Columbia River is that you have these deep water ports, big rail loops, and that lets you export it. The driver for these facilities is exporting oil overseas. So if the Port of Lewiston was going to do it, they'd have to barge the oil down and then potentially transfer that. There are some ocean-going barges, but I don't think those are the ones that are coming up to Lewiston. Um, my, my, my no, ATVs I don't think come all the way up here. <laughs> One of the most remarkable arguments that the oil train terminal in Vancouver tried to make was that an oil spill would be good for fish because yeah. it would stop people from fishing. They, with it's a straight face. Because the cleanup would yeah. employ so many people. With a straight face, yeah. they hired a guy from the East Coast to come in in a suit, and in the hearing, 
He argued, he said, look, what actually happens is that oil spill goes down, the fishery closes, and more fish survive. Oh, my God. And uh, to their credit, the Energy Council of Washington, that was essentially their reaction. Oh, my God. Um, one of the council members who was, who was the, um, with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, he just sort of stopped and said, I just want to make sure I'm hearing you correctly. You are arguing, and then he repeated what he said, and the guy's name was um, Todd Shotsky, um, and he said, yes. And I think that's when they lost. I think it was right around that moment because um, Zachary Penny, who's a uh, Nez Perce uh, tribal member who's working with Critvik, um, he was one of the experts who testified about what an oil spill would actually do to the fishery. And you know, when the, when the council had to weigh an expert who really knew the area, knew exactly what the fishery was all about, versus this guy who was saying, yeah, it's actually gonna be a net benefit, they sided unanimously with um, the arguments that the tribes had made. And that was uh, a very, very powerful precedent. The state of Washington had never really done anything quite like that, where they had a three-year evidentiary process that ended in a unanimous decision of denial that the governor ultimately signed. Um, and that, I just can't overstate how much of a role the Columbia River tribes, Nez Perce, and all the others played in that. That was, um, it was decisive. So, and for that reason, you know, everyone else who gets to enjoy an oil-free neighborhood or river um, has many folks here to thank. So with that, I just want to say thank you, Elliot and Julian, for having me here again. And, Thanks. Yeah.